All right, ladies, it's 10 o'clock. Um, panelists, I should say. Um, it's 10 o'clock, and I think for the sake of everyone's time, we'll go ahead and, and get started, and we might have more attendees trickling in, uh, but we want to be respectful of the time. So I want to say hi to everyone, and thank you for attending our Wayne Rotter Capture webinar this morning. Um, we're so happy that you can spend part of your Saturday morning with us, and we hope that in this time you learn and get a lot of useful information that you're going to be able to use. This webinar is probably co-sponsored by the Basqua um, Bay Area Water Conservation Agency and the City of Palo Alto. My name is Susie and I'll be your moderator today with your presenters Chris Clarvetti, Rain Barrel Specialist, and Pamela Boyle Rodriguez, City of Palo Alto Stormwater Program Manager. So well, let's get started. Just some quick housekeeping first. Next slide, please. Before we begin the program, just want to provide some guidelines so how we can have a successful participation in this webinar. First of all, all attendees are muted by default to reduce background noise to the presentation. We'll be pausing periodically throughout the presentation to allow questions and side note, we highly, highly encourage questions, so please ask away. There are two ways of doing this. The first way is um, by clicking on that Q&A button as seen on your screen and typing in your question. We'll either respond directly uh, via typing or we'll allow the presenter to, to verbally respond. The second option and one that will open up for the end of the presentation is you can raise your hand, meaning you would click that button, a little blue hand will appear by your name, and at the end of the presentation, we can unmute you so you can ask your question out loud. And again, we're gonna save this for just the end of the presentation so we can avoid muting and unmuting people, which might um, make this a little longer. <laughs> um, I'd also like to note that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available Will be the link will be linked out, um, mailed out to everyone here, all registrants. Also, the list of links and resources mentioned in the presentation will also be emailed out to all registrants. During our presentation today, we'll also be asking some short poll questions to get a pulse on what everyone is thinking. To make sure everyone feels comfortable using this poll feature, we are going to launch our first practice poll. So get ready. You should see a window um, pop up with a question on the screen and some answer choices. So tell us, do you already have a rain barrel, cistern, or rain garden installed in your home? You'll have four possible answers to choose from. And in this case, this is multiple choice. You can select all that apply for those that have both a rain barrel and a rain garden, or maybe even a, a cistern as well. So you can select all three. If you don't have any, go ahead and click none of the above. I'm gonna give you guys just a few more seconds and then we're gonna close the poll. All right, so I'm gonna close the poll. And now we're gonna see what everyone said. So a lot of people they're dipping their toes in the water here. I hope we can convince everyone that these are all great ideas. And then we do have one or two people who have a rain barrel and a cistern at home. Um, so that is awesome. So that's how the polls work. And we're gonna be doing a few of those throughout the presentation. Again, get your feedback and see what everyone's thinking. Before we begin, um, do you want to talk a little bit about our co-sponsored agency here? Um, Basqua Landscape Education Program is the first thing I want to talk about. Um, Basqua is a special district that represents the interest of 26 cities, water districts, and private water companies, all which purchase wholesale water from the San Francisco Regional Water System. Basqua member agencies collectively serve 1.8 million residents and 40,000 businesses in San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Alameda counties. Next slide. 
Bosco provides a regional water conservation program to support our agencies in improving water use efficiency. The landscape education program is one element of the conservation program. While we have made significant strides in water use efficiency in the past decade, we all know there's still more room for improvement. Outdoor water provides the single biggest potential source of untapped savings. Reducing outdoor water use through the use of water efficient plants and innovative techniques can help conserve water to ensure that future water supply needs of our communities are met. Next slide. Oh, all right. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our rain barrel specialist, Chris Corvetti. And Susie, we're going to talk a little bit more about BASQA programs and rebates at the very end. Okay. So we'll be ready for that at the end of the presentation. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Chris Corvetti. I'm a rain barrel specialist here in the Bay Area. And I'm super excited to talk to you guys about rainwater harvesting. So I guess the big question that we're all here to answer is why harvest rainwater? And usually in an in-person presentation, I would pose this question to you guys and hope to get some of these answers back. Fortunately, in a webinar, you guys just get my voice. So we're going to look at some of the obvious reasons, you know, we save water because we're going to be using some of that rainwater again rather than using municipal water. So it's going to lower your water bill. It also helps with moisture around your building because it's taking some of that water that would have gone straight around your building and holding it for a period before using it in a drier season. They can be really, really gorgeous. So you can do a rain garden that really adds aesthetic value to your home. It requires less maintenance than a lot of basic irrigation systems. A lot of rain gardens, we're gonna talk about how they're a little bit less maintenance when you use native plants. It, gives you a connection to nature because with those native plants you're going to have hummingbirds, you're going to have butterflies, uh, maybe some nice local bees coming around to say hello and just really, really pretty connection to nature right in your own front yard. Uh, it can prevent erosion and local flooding. Um, in certain areas, depending on the type of soil you have, it can replenish groundwater. Um, in, in your home, it may not be a real concern depending on where your groundwater level is or your soil type. So that might not be one of your biggest concerns. But one of the ones we really wanna look at today is it can reduce polluted runoff from stormwater. And that's a really important one. And that ties right into improving the water quality in the creek. It can also give your plant, make your plants a little bit healthier since the rainwater doesn't have that same treatment as the municipal water, it's not as chlorinated. So some of our stormwater pollution sources in the Bay Area and in any urban area, really, you're looking at oil from restaurants. They get put out back to before they can go through the process to be recycled. And a lot of times those containers can leak and end up getting out into pavement that will then get washed into a storm drain. Uh, when you have building supplies for construction sites, you'll have concrete. You can see in this picture on the right, you can see concrete powder kind of flowing down towards the storm drain and it gets in our roads. We know when we drive through, we'll see a lot of construction materials kind of on the road, on the side of our highways. And while we're driving, we also might have some oil leaking from our cars, maybe a little bit of rust, some brake dust if we brake really hard. And all of that kind of flakes out onto the road. And then when we get a big wash of rain, that's gonna flush it into our storm drains. Uh, right now, a lot of us are dealing with ash from these forest fires. So that's something you, you see a lot of. And if you think about a couple weeks ago, we all came out of our houses and saw a layer of ash on our vehicles. All of that ash is, you know, sitting on the ground. A lot of that ash isn't just from wood, it's from homes. It's from, you know, different chemicals that are used in the homes and that ash sits there and that's going to get washed into the storm drains. Um, you can see a car wash in this picture in the bottom left. And a lot of um, car washes in this area do capture and recycle their water, but not all of them. And so you really want to be mindful, especially, you know, we can't wash our cars in our own driveway because that'll run right into the road and the soap really affects the fish in the creeks. Um, 
we want to same thing with overwatering our landscape, uh, keeping an eye out for broken sprinklers, because all of that adds extra water to flush all of those pollutants down towards our storm drains. Um, pet waste, I have a dog and I have friends who have cats. And a lot of people think about dog waste and they pick up their dog waste, but not a lot of people think about cats and cat waste. Um, right now, a big issue down in Monterey is that sea otters are starting to get a type of brain cancer that's caused from the different bacteria that's found in cat waste. So we're starting to think about cat, outdoor cats as well as dogs. Um, just basic plastic and garbage that we see every day on the side of the roads. All of that kind of goes into our storm drains. So let's talk a little bit about storm drains. We have another poll for you guys. What happens when water flows through a gutter and down a storm drain? I'm gonna give you guys a couple minutes to answer this and Susie will let me know when we have all our answers. And this is really, you know, we're looking at all of these issues and it's starting to, to see a lot of things that maybe we don't normally see during this rainy season. But if everyone, you know, as you're doing this poll, just think about when you're sitting at home and we finally get rain this fall, what the streets are gonna look like. You know, we don't just get a little bit of rain, it kind of flows off everything and we see water running down the sides of the roads, just like this picture. So it's kind of what we're thinking about here. Okay, so you guys are experts on this. You know, it all, pretty much all of you guys flows into our creeks and straight into the bay untreated. So we're going to take a look at that and then we're going to talk about some of the solutions. So our sanitary sewer does that, one of those options on the questionnaire was it flows through a sanitary sewer into a treatment plant. That is what happens from our toilets, our dishwashers, our laundry machines, or everything in our house goes out into the sewer and it goes to the water quality control plant in Palo Alto where it gets treated before it goes back out into nature. Everything gets treated and the water is all clean, cleaned up before it goes out. But everything that goes into that storm drain goes straight into the storm drain directly into our creeks and then flows down the creeks and straight into the bay. And that's really concerning because we just talked about all these different things that could possibly be in that water. So if we look at that storm water, we look at a roof, it comes off the roof and all of these hard surfaces, the roof, the street, all of those surfaces are things that aren't here naturally. They are, they're man-made. So those are hard surfaces where the water probably would have at one point just sunk straight into the ground and it wouldn't have been an issue. But in urban areas, we have parking lots, we have streets, we have houses, and all of that is a non-permeal surface. It all sits on that and runs off. So then we hits our lawn or our landscape and it can pick up maybe some fertilizer or some pesticides or some pet waste and then it flows out into the road where it picks up that brake dust and that you know the ash we talked about from the forest fires the motor oil and then it runs down into our st storm drain so all of that combines to make not the healthiest environment for our fish in our creeks and for the rest of the bay and heading out into the ocean all of those animals really need that clean water and it's it's being polluted so there's some really great solutions that we're looking at now, especially in Palo Alto. Um, and some of that's called green stormwater infrastructure. And green infrastructure is stuff that we're gonna talk about today, such as rain barrels, rain gardens, cisterns, pervious pavement, but also things like green roofs, which you're gonna see, you know, maybe not the best option for your home, but really a great option for some of the more public buildings. Um, you're going to see larger scale public things, especially in Palo Alto, you'll see these curb cuts, which you can see in, in both the upper right and the lower left picture. You can see a cuts in the curb 
where the water can flow into a green area that's sunken. So all that street water goes into a green area and that slows down that water so it has a chance to sink into the ground before going to a storm drain. So there's a lot of different infrastructure that the city is doing now to make the city actually account for all of the more um, commercial locations. But we're gonna talk about some of the stuff that you can do right at your own home. So we're gonna talk about some rain barrels and there's a lot of different types of barrels. This one in the top corner is kind of a non-standard barrel. It's called a raindrop box slim line and it's very, very low profile. So you can put it in a smaller area if you don't have room for a bigger, bigger barrel. We're gonna talk about some rain gardens. This garden here is at Hoover Park in Palo Alto and it's right around a storm drain. You can see that in the middle and that actually slows the water before it hits that storm drain. So a lot more water goes into the ground. And we're gonna talk about some cisterns, which are a larger form of a rain barrel. When you get over 200 gallons, we consider it a cistern. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. And we're gonna talk about pervious pavement. So I'm gonna actually start with that last one. And if you take a look at this picture in the bottom right, you can see this is actually a driveway. There's a car parked in the driveway. You can see those back tires. And I bet in your neighborhood, you've seen a lot of driveways like, like this. This one is slabs of concrete with grass in between. So when the water hits that concrete, it flows into one of those areas of grass and is able to actually soak into the ground. And sometimes you'll see it with stones or river rocks. And sometimes you'll see it in this case with grass. And we're gonna kind of break down what it takes for that to be a pervious pavement. And that's kind of the most common type that I see in my neighborhood. Uh, people have been doing them for a long time. And it basically how it works in this bottom left picture, they have that pervious pavement, or in this case, it's actually non-pervious concrete with gaps in it so that you have that grass coming in. But underneath, you have a couple of layers of bedding and base and sub-base. And those are all designed to help that water be able to sink in rather than run off onto the road. And you might need a drain, you might not, depending on your type of soil. So you can kind of see this diagram, how that works. I'm not gonna talk a lot about pervious pavement because we didn't really come here for that today, but I think it's really a cool idea. And they've actually invented this really awesome one. The second picture on the bottom is porous cement. And if you look, you can see a hose is pouring directly onto a slab of cement and that water is coming straight through it underneath. And this porous cement is being used now at a lot of parks and you can see Mitchell Park in this top right picture. All of the parking spaces have this permeable asphalt parking. So anywhere where cars are parked, if you, know, you spill your bottle of water on it, you'll see it soak right into the ground rather than flow off down the road to the storm drain. And when it rains, it has that same effect. It just soaks right through into the ground. And Mitchell Park is designed the same way in this How It Works picture, where you can see the um, previous pavement on top. And then, there we go. And then the water really soaks slowly through the base and the bedding and the sub base. And it goes right into the ground rather than hitting those storm drains. And all those layers will trap any of those pollutants we talked about aren't gonna run through those layers. So they'll kind of get trapped in it and that will help filter the water. So by the time the water hits that drain, that water has actually been cleaned quite a bit by nature. So if you guys are interested in pervious pavement, um, let us know if you'd like to do a full webinar about pervious pavement. And as far as now, I'm just kind of whetting your appetite and we'll talk a little bit about some rebates available for that at the end of the presentation. So as we finish up that poll, we're gonna head forward to talk about rain gardens. Oh, 
Okay, Susie, you're going to store away that information for Palo Alto's future use, and we're going to take a look at some rain gardens. So this picture on the left is the native rain garden installed in Bull Park in Palo Alto a few years ago. And you can see it's grown up quite a bit in the last few years and it's looking pretty healthy. And it's actually right next to a community native rain garden that has been there for many, many years. And this was just extending it down all the way to the bike path. So this one actually captures water off the bike path. So the bike path no longer floods because flooding was a bit of an issue there. And the main idea for a rain garden is to slow it, spread it, and sink it. And I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard that expression, slow it, spread it, sink it. And it really is exactly what it sounds like. You want to slow that water down. You want to kind of spread it out and you want to sink it into the ground. And all of that is to keep it from going down our storm drains with all of those pollutants that we learned about that are on those hard surfaces. Um, when you have a rain garden, especially if you use native plants, you really don't need as much irrigation because native plants are adapted to have a lot of water in the rainy season and not need much water in the dry season. And because you have water from the street set up to kind of flow into it or water from your house or water from your rain barrels set to flow into this rain garden, you don't need to water it very much at all. And so it really reduces your irrigation issues. Um, as we said, it slows it, spreads it, and sinks it. So it reduces that flooding. It reduces sewer overflows and erosion. And really can be very gorgeous. It'll enhance your landscape. Again, butterflies and all sorts of wonderful wildlife. Uh, native plants are very low maintenance. You trim them back a little bit once a year. They're extremely low maintenance. My entire front yard, I work on maybe twice a year, and it looks great. Um, there's a Valley Water Qualifying Plant List, which is going to be included in our follow-up email, which will tell you which plants you need to use to qualify for the rain garden rebate, and which plants they really recommend to, to use that less irrigation and, and really save our potable water. So we're going to take a look at the anatomy of a traditional rain garden. This is, you know, a very traditional rain garden, maybe not what you'll do at your own home. But you have that water starting at the top here and it's coming off of you know a house a sidewalk a driveway a parking lot it might come off of a sloping hillside or you might have your rain barrel overflowing into this there are so many different sources you can use for your rain garden um i on the top really like to use river rocks because it gives it that kind of dry creek bed look when there is no water which i find aesthetically pleasing you might have something different that you like for your own home. Underneath uh, traditionally is used a bioswale soil, which is a mix of compost and aggregate or sand. So you have a compost and sand mixture, and that really allows you to, to get that water to really soak through. And then in the bottom, you have that drainage rock which again is going to allow that water to soak down into the ground. So you'll get a temporary ponding while it's raining or while you have water flowing into this rain garden, but it's going to be more of a dry creek bed for most of the year. If you use mulch on your raised berms, it really helps to keep that moisture in the soil. I really like mulch in any garden. Um, you can also do something called sheet mulching where you put down cardboard first and then the mulch and that cardboard acts as another insulating layer to keep that moisture in the ground. Um, and if you, if you combine this with a rain barrel, you get a really efficient system. And uh, you know, for your home, you're, you really want to take a look at those uh, rebate requirements for Palo Alto. And some of them are listed here in this diagram. And we're going to talk about them a little bit more at the end. And this is kind of what a rain garden looks like if it's coming right off your house. You can see the water coming down your downspout and flowing into your rain garden. And you're going to have, you know, six to 12 inch of a ponding depth here. And we're going to talk a little bit more. Pam is an expert on all the rebate requirements for Palo Alto. 
we're going to talk about those at the end of the presentation. But one of the things that everybody always asks me, is there really enough rain for it to be worth it? We live in the Bay Area, we don't get much rain. So the answer simply is yes, absolutely. Um, if you have a thousand square foot area, you're gonna capture over 600 gallons of water in a one inch storm. And here's an equation so you can calculate your harvesting potential. On the right, you can see two pictures. This is actually the same site. The top picture is during the dry season. You can see it looks like a dry creek bed. The bottom picture is during a rain event. And you can see it's just totally filled and it can't even handle that much water because there's just so much water coming down. And even in our average storms, which are about half an inch, you really get a lot. So here's the equation again. And if you have a paper and pen, you can go ahead and enter in your own roof size and the amount of rain you want to calculate for and figure out how much you want for yours. And so I'm going to do everything at a thousand square feet and the average event here is about half an inch. And that with that conversion factor of 0.62 gallons per inch square foot you get about 310 gallons for a half an inch of rain. But in Palo Alto, we only get about 17 inches of rain per year. And that totals for a thousand square foot roof, about 10,540 gallons of water. So that's more water than you're gonna be able to capture. Unfortunately, we are gonna have to let some of it, you know, continue down onto our landscape and onto our driveways, but we can get a lot of that out of the system and really, really capture it and get it sunk into the ground. Susie, did I see a couple questions popping up? Yes, ma'am. Um, these are both related to previous pavement. Oh, I'm um, sorry. That either, yeah, that either you or, or Pam, please chime in with the answers here. Both are from Rich, and the first one is, we have fairly light and moderate rainfall here in Palo Alto. Does previous pavement work with heavy rain? Pam, do you want to take that one on? Sure. So as Chris mentioned, the average rainfall in Palo Alto is around five inches, and, and it's about that in San Mateo County, and as you go south, it even decreases. So this, the perfect pavement systems, whatever they are, are definitely able to capture half an inch an hour and can capture even up to two inches per hour in the East Coast in certain projects. So that is not an issue. Um, and I noticed another question, if you could yeah. ask that too, Susan. Yes. Um, are there complications if pervious pavement freezes? So pervious pavement systems actually have been found to store heat underneath them. So they tend to help thaw ice and snow that falls on them. And they've also been known to require less road salt. So, which um, is a great benefit to water quality since um, chlorides from salt have impacts a lot of the Great Lakes in other areas in the Midwest. All right, and we just had one more pervious pavement question pop in just now, thought I would share that. If we use pervious pavers next to our house, our house already has water problems in the crawl space. With water sinking into the ground, will it be advisable to use pervious pavers? Well, I would say that it'd be best to talk to a licensed contractor about that. I would say my, just in my uh, less experienced opinion about that, that what I have heard about these type of installations is that if you uh, put impermeable barrier between the pervious pavement and the home, that it, it should be fine. But I would definitely ask a licensed contractor and you are required to have a licensed contractor install your pervious pavement through our the city of Palo Alto's stormwater rebate program. So you would need to talk to a licensed contractor anyway. Great. That Thanks, is Kim. actually a wonderful lead-in question to our next topic, unless we have another permeal pavement question. We actually have a rain garden question. I'm gonna pivot. Oh, oh, oh. We'll go <laughs> the rain garden question from Chris. If most of the runoff from my roof already sinks into my yard, does rain garden provide additional benefits? 
It does. So depending on the, the layout of your yard, um, you might be able to get 100% of that rainfall to go into a rain garden because you would dig out that soil and you would actually capture all that water rather than just most of it. Also, if you, if you take a look at the native plants, I, I'm not sure exactly what you have in your garden now, but you might find with native plants or the plants that are on that approved list, you might find that your irrigation needs in the dry season and in the summer actually lessen so you, you might save some money on watering and you might find that you get more butterflies or native you know fun little critters uh butterflies hummingbirds to come visit your garden great we can continue on and take a different break later on for more questions great i'm gonna go back to that previous question that was asking that they they already have some water issues in their crawl space and uh, wondering about that permeal pavement and Pam did a great job answering that. But what I, when I hear that, I go, oh, you know what the perfect solution for you is? It's a rain barrel. So rain barrels are a great way to grab, you know, that first 50, 100, 200 gallons of water that come off your roof. And then that is, you know, 50, 100, 200 gallons of water that is no longer has the option of going into your crawl space. So it actually is, is making less water from your roof going into your landscaping during a heavy event. And then you can store that water and use it later for your garden or your landscaping. And that way it goes into the ground when the ground is dry and not when it's totally saturated. So it'll be less likely to find its way into your crawl space. So there's my, my little transition. Thank you for that question. Um, it also decreases the need for irrigating with municipal water because you're gonna be holding some of that water to use during the dry season. Um, we already talked about it will reduce the flooding for that same reason and reduce moisture around your building. It improves your water quality in creeks for all those reasons we already talked about. And it's really great. I found that, you know, neighbors will come over and strike up conversation. Well, before COVID, with COVID now, it's not much of neighbors coming over. But it's great because you can strike up conversation, really talk about your rain barrels and how you use them. Some of them can be really attractive. This is an adapted wine barrel at Gamble Gardens. You can see it totally fits in with their landscaping and just looks very attractive and rustic in that location. So we're going to talk about the anatomy of a rain barrel. And the best picture I have for this is actually a cistern. So this picture in the middle is a 265 gallon rain cistern. And we will talk a little bit more about cisterns later. But in this case, it is set up exactly the same way you would set up a rain barrel. And it is a really nice picture because it's bigger, I can really show off all the different parts and pieces. So we're gonna kind of travel the way the rain travels. So we got rain hitting our roof here at the top. And I'm gonna change my ink color since I already have red on the page. So we're gonna go find an ink color that works. How about a nice bright orange? Okay, kind of looks like red. Uh, we got our rain coming down in, and that's our downspout right there there. After that downspout, it is hitting something called a leaf eater, which we're going to talk about when we talk about accessories. And that leaf eater screens the water so that any leaves, because it's a leaf eater, any leaves or debris get caught on that and then it gets cleaned off easily. From there, it flows into our tank all the way in and then we get, you know, a water level in the tank. Um, probably not swarmy, so it's probably a pretty flat water level. And when we want to figure out how much water we have in that tank, we can look at this depth gauge, which is also another accessory. Just like, you know, clothing, you can accessorize your rain barrel, so you don't need all of these options. These are just options you can have on a barrel. This barrel happens to have quite a few of them. And that depth gauge, you can see here, it's actually saying that our barrel is full from that green arrow. And when that barrel gets totally full, 
it will overflow and the water will come out this overflow and this overflow runs all the way down and then out to a garden in this case. So on this overflow in the second picture on the left hand side, you can see there's also a piece of screening. And that piece of screening is required. We really want to make sure that we can't get any mosquitoes into our rain barrel. So we use that screening to keep anything out. And it also helps if any little debris comes in through the first screen, it'll kind of get stuck and not come out where we don't want it to come out. Um, it's really, in my opinion, important to earthquake proof any system you have, especially if you have small kids that like to climb on things. So we use metal strapping, and in this case, it's strapped to a fence. And you can see that strapping is in four spots strapped to the fence here. And then at the bottom, you can see a hose curled up. And next to that hose, we have the output. And in this case, we have something called a split output. So we have a lever here that turns the water coming out of the rain barrel on or off. And if we bring the water this way and turn this one on as well, it runs into our hose and we can water anything we need with the hose. There's no pump on this particular system. It's another accessory we're going to talk about. But in this case, when, especially when the barrel is full, you have all that gravity pressure on 265 gallons of water that's pushing down. So you can actually use that hose for a pretty good distance. This other one goes out to a system to irrigate a rain garden. And this happens to be a pipe that's dug through the ground, underground to a rain garden about 15 feet away. So I don't have a, a good picture of where that pipe's going, but I can turn off the hose and turn on this, this one in back and use it to water that. Now that's a very manual system. It's very hands-on. If you want to do anything with it, you have to go turn it off. Some people really don't want to take the time to do that. So the other option is to set up timers, like this bottom picture here. And so with this system, all my knobs are left on. And I have timers set up to run a two separate drip irrigation systems. And one is going to a little garden on one side and the other one is going to a redwood tree that we are trying to save. And with that system, I also have an additional filter down here. And we're gonna look at that a little bit later on. I have a better close up picture of the filter. And that filter is just because the drip lines have those really fine holes and I don't want any sediment to get into my drip lines to clog them up. But when I'm using a hose like the picture above, you really don't need that extra layer of filter. So as we, we're gonna move forward and talk about each step of this a little bit more and some of our accessories. So on that barrel we just looked at, the inflow was a full diversion. So that means all of the water from that roof goes into that barrel. It was just an open pipe set above the barrel flowing into it. But there's actually a way that you can, if you have, say, a French drain, you can keep your downspout exactly where it is, not cut it at all, except put a little hole in it, and put one of these systems in this bottom picture in. And this is called a partial diversion. So this is partially diverting rainflow. It does have some of the same requirements. You still need screening, which we talked about. You really don't want those mosquitoes breeding. You don't want those extra pollution pollutants in your system. So you still have to put a screening. And in this case, the screen goes right here. Um, so in this system, the water comes down inside your downspout and it'll get caught in this outer ring. And then it'll flow into your rain barrel down this tube that way. And then once your rain barrel is filled, the water will actually fill up this whole pipe and it'll come out and it'll go up over that little rubber and back down your downspout. And so this one little device takes care of your inflow as well as your overflow. So you don't need to drill another hole in your barrel. This is a really great for a lot of the 
pre-packaged kits, which we're gonna talk about later, but you can use this for a larger system as well. If you are gonna look at a cistern, I do recommend maybe doing a full divert because you'll capture the water a little bit faster that way. If you are gonna have a separate overflow, you really want it high on the barrel. So for example, in this barrel in the top picture, I want my overflow right about here in the very top because you want to capture as much water as possible. And if your overflow is lower on the barrel, you're gonna lose that water on the top. You won't be able to capture anything above your overflow. Your overflow does have to drain onto your own property. So if you're using the system like the bottom picture, you already have that downspout going somewhere. So after you divert your 50, 100, or 200 gallons into your system, the rest of the water is gonna go where it was headed anyway. If you do a full divert like that picture we saw before, or this upper picture, you now have all the water from your downspout coming into this barrel. And once the barrel fills, that water has to go somewhere. Legally, it has to go onto your own property. You can't flood your neighbor's side and you can't flood it onto the street. So it's, this is a really good opportunity if you have a rain garden, you can flow it into a rain garden or just some sort of a swale or depressed area. Um, or if you have a French drain, you can feed it into that French drain. Um, I, did I have a few questions on this, Susie? Yes. Um, there are a couple specifically about downspouts. Okay, great. One, yeah. One, this is a, a longer question, so bear with me. <laughs> uh, currently, our downspouts drain down into an underground pipe, which connects to a dry well about five feet away from the house. We are considering adding a 50-gallon decorative rain barrel at each downspout. After the rain barrel is full, we would like to have the access overflow from the rain barrel go back to the downspout so it can go back to the underground dry well. We haven't found any rain barrels of decorative rain barrels we like that have overflow discharge spout at the top of the barrel. Are there any types of rain barrels you can recommend for this purpose? Yeah, so we're, we're definitely going to talk about different types of rain barrels as we move forward in the presentation. Um, so I would say what you have now is I would consider a French drain and that French drain is where that pipe goes into the ground and into something else or into landscaping, but it's right next to your house. The pipe is going underground and you're not seeing directly where it's going. Um, the best system for you is this bottom picture and this is a basic diverter kit. Um, you can buy them on Amazon for like $35. And they also come with a lot of the basic rain barrels come with this kit already. So depending on which type of barrel you buy, you might find that. So we're going to take a look at those different types of barrels as we move farther into the presentation. All right. And then one more regarding downspouts. My house is older and has metal downspouts that are too small to hold the diverters that come with the standard rain barrels. Who can I call to change my downspout? Most contractors want big jobs. If, depending on the type of system you want, if you hire a contractor to do your full installation, they will take care of that for you. Um, you there's also the option you can cut the downspout yourself and you know go to Home Depot and get the parts and you know put a different size downspout on your system. And if you look around, I know the two inch square downspouts are really difficult to find a diverter for. Um, but if you have any, any other size, you might be able to find a diverter for it. I will say I've had a lot of trouble in the past with the two inch square ones, which is probably what you're looking at. And that at that point, it might be easiest to do a full divert and then run, the, run an overflow back into your lines. Great. Thanks, Chris. We do have a few more questions, but they're about leaf eaters and pumps and maintenance, gonna which you're going to be covering. So awesome. I'll let you Awesome. We're going to talk first. about that now. Let's, yeah. let's get into that. Great. So and I, I did put some, you know, price ranges for each of these accessories on here because that's a question I get a lot. And, you know, that it is a price range. I'm sorry, it can't be more specific, but it really depends on the type of system you're putting in. Um, so 
the question is to first flush or not to first flush. And a first flush diverter works like this. The water comes in the top and it fills up this first flush diverter. And as that water fills up, this ball will float. And when that ball gets to the top, there's a rubber gasket right here. And that rubber gasket and the ball will create a seal. So once that ball floats to the top, all the water coming in will then flow into your barrel. And the idea of that is if you are really concerned about additional pollutants in your system, or if you live in a high dust or high particulate area, this will allow all of, all of that first flush of water, which is usually the dirtiest water, um, to, to get caught in this bottom pipe. And then that pipe will slowly drain away at the bottom before the next storm. And all you need to do is clean it out, you know, after every storm or every couple months to make sure you're not getting too much of that sediment built up in there. If you live in somewhere that it's a low dust area, there's really not a lot of overgrowth, you really don't want to do the maintenance on it, and you're going to be watering with a large hose, an open-ended hose, you're not going to be using a drip irrigation, so you're really not worried about those smaller particulates, you may not need a first flush diverter. Um, you can also just, you know, if you, if you decide that you have it and then you don't want it, you can, you can change your system later, um, or put a cap in the inside. It is really an optional system. So as I said, it's an accessory. It's, you know, the bright pink handbag to go with the dress or, you know, the tie clip to go with a nice tie. Do we have a first flush diverter specific question, Susie? No. Okay. Um, the next accessory we're gonna take a look at is the depth gauge. So you, biggest question is, well, how much water is in my tank? There's many different ways to tell. One is you can just tap on your barrel, you know, tap start at the bottom, work your way up. When it starts to sound hollow, that's the level your water's at. Or you can install this little floating device and this little thing is, it's just a float on a string and you set the gauges. So you decide where empty is gonna be and where full is gonna be on your system. And then that float will float and tell you what percentage you have full. You can also, for a little bit more money, get one with a digital system. So this is great for folks who have a water tank set up in their crawl space or maybe an underground system. These systems are really hard to check the depth on if you've got to crawl down there and actually look at the gauge. So some of them have systems that send a signal and you can put this in your kitchen where you can check it a little bit more easily. And these systems are usually set up as a percentage. So you need to know how many gallons your tank holds and then it'll tell you what percentage it's at rather than how many gallons you have. The next one we're gonna talk about is a leaf feeder. Um, there's a couple different styles and they can range from about 30 to $60. These are always gonna connect between your downspout and your barrel, so above your barrel. They're really easy to clean. Um, you can see in this picture, this just pops off. You can tap it against the side of your barrel. All the leaf and debris will come off of it and then you just put it back on. You can even use the water in your rain barrel to rinse it out a little bit. It can act as the required screening if your barrel does not have a screen built in. A lot of barrels will already have a screen built in, but not all of them. So this can take that place of that required screening to keep mosquitoes out. A lot of people Chris, say, yep. I'm sorry, we did have a question from Mandy about leaf eaters and leaves um, getting clogged. Uh, where the leaves are caught, if there's a lot of debris from the downspout, how much leaf debris can the system hold? So if you do have a lot of leaf debris, I definitely recommend putting a leaf eater. Um, you can see they're sloped. And in this picture on the left, you can actually see the water is going straight, but the leaves are kind of getting pushed to the front. And a lot of that, especially the lighter weight leaves, will just kind of fluff off the front. And that's, that makes it really easy to keep it clean. Um, in this system, it doesn't have anything on top in this upper system, but the, if you set it up so the water hits kind of higher on that screen, the leaves will start to collect on this lower section down here, 
and the water will still pass through. These are so easy to clean that when I walk by, you know, I might even just be going to my car to head to the grocery store and I'll walk by and I'll just pop it off and clean it if I see any debris on it. So you really want to have it at a, a height that you can reach easily. And it's something you'll just, you'll just do on your, on your way to work or whatever. It's not, it's not something you need to plan a half hour to clean. This is something very easy to clean. Okay. And when related to debris and sort of all this, is there a problem with using roof runoff to water my plants? We have a flat roof. Thanks. That is a great, great question. I was going to talk about roofs a little later on, but now is just as good a time as any. Um, so there are different types of roofs and different roofs, you know, come with different benefits and different concerns. With a flat roof, it normally is treated. It is absolutely fine for watering a garden for a decorative garden. As far as if you're gonna look at edibles, you do wanna take in some consideration. If you have shakes or a flat roof, you may not wanna water your edibles because shakes have you know, an oily coating that they use to make them waterproof. Um, even shingles, if they're newer, you'll have some of the asphalt will come off. Um, and the flat roofs have like a powdery chemical they use to treat them. And all of, all those types of roofs, you, you might not want those chemicals that are used to treat them into your edible foods. But as far as your plants that are decorative, the, the, that roof water is already going on those plants. It's not going to hurt them. Um, you, I wouldn't want to go up there and spray an herbicide on your roof and then have it hooked into a system. So if you do treat your roof regularly with an herbicide, this might not be the best idea for you. But this is a great system for any roof if you're going to do decorative plants. Um, awesome. If you're looking at tile roofs or shingles or metal roofs, there's no issues at all using this rain barrel to water your edible plants. Great. And just one final question and we'll move on. Do you recommend gutter guards to protect the whole width of the gutter? If so, what kind? Um, I don't use gutter guards. I clean my gutters regularly. We'll talk about that a little bit with maintenance. Um, I do sometimes put a screening on the downspout where the downspout comes in from the gutter. I'll put just a metal basket up there so that you know, when I get up there to clean my gutters, I don't have an issue of anything coming into that downspout if I, you know, maybe forget to clean my gutters before the first storm. Um, there are different gutter guards. There's foam ones, there's metal ones that go above your gutters, there's acrylic ones. They all have benefits and disadvantages that are very unique to each individual's house. Uh, one of the issues I found is with all of those gutter guards is a lot of the water sometimes gets sprayed over the gutter at that point. And for me, for my house, I don't really like that to have water not going in my gutters because I want it all to go through my gutters and into my barrels. Um, so it's, it, it really is, you know, a personal decision. So the pump that I usually use is called an on-demand pump. And it's really great if you prefer to use a hose to water your plants, you really don't want to use a drip system, you, you, you want to use a hose. It'll screw directly into the barrel. Um, you can use a quick connect. And if you have a contractor set up, they can set that up for you or you can go to a, a hardware store and find quick connects and set it up. It's really simple to use. If there is water coming into it and a need for water to come out of it, the pump will run. If the if you have a hose with a handle on it and the handle's turned off and there's water coming in, the pump will turn off. It is a very simple, there's no on off switch for this type of pump, it's just on demand. It's the cheapest type of pump that you can use for a rain barrel and about the easiest to use. You just plug it in, hook it to the barrel, and you're all set. These are not pumps that are made to be put in the barrel. If you do have like a below ground cistern, which we'll talk about later, you'll get a different type of pump and it'll cost a little bit more, but it's a different setup. And you can also get automatic pumps that are set up on a timer to run an irrigation system, but they need to be more water resistant. This is the more basic style of pump. 
and I'm happy to answer questions on pumps at the end of the presentation. We are getting short on time and I wanna get through a little bit more. Um, so we already really talked about the drip timers and you know drip irrigation, you can set it up for manual or for a drip timer, we really talked about that already. And you really just wanna think about how you're gonna use your water when you set up your system and your output for your system. Because if you want to use watering cans, then you need to make sure that you have a way to fill those watering cans and your system isn't set up as a closed system like all of all these ones pictured. Actually, right here, you can see this does have a, a valve to fill watering cans. Um, this is the filter I was talking about. It's a very basic part you can get at Home Depot. And this part on the bottom just screws off. The filter, pop, filter pops out. You can use a bottle brush to clean it. And then you're all set again, and it'll filter out all those really fine particulates. And if you want to run your water into a landscape pond or a dry creek bed, uh, you can, and you really don't need as much filtration. You just use a larger hose to do that, or a larger pipe to set that up, and you can run it out. And the main thing is it's really great to be able to use that water a little bit later when it's not during a rain event to get that water into your garden. So we're talking about the basics for rain barrels, but not really how to set one up at your own house. So if you are interested in having the city of Palo Alto offer a webinar about how to install rain barrels, do it yourself style at your house, let us know on this poll. And this picture here is at Tierra Linda School. Um, in San Carlos, and they did this as a project this past year. And you can see it's really cool. This barrel allows you to plant plants right in the top of it. So it's kind of a fun way to have the barrels be part of your garden. And we're actually gonna start talking about the different types of barrels now. And I'm gonna go through a little quickly because we're at an hour. And Susie, correct me if I'm wrong, what time are we supposed to be done? This is an hour and a half one. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go a little bit faster through the types of barrels since you guys are all interested in doing a DIY workshop, you'll learn more about this at that type of a workshop. Um, so we already kind of talked about the wine barrel conversions. If you're a little bit more hands-on or if you're gonna hire a contractor to do your installation, wine barrels are really a great option. You do need to be comfortable with power tools or have a contractor do it because it's the holes are not already installed. You're gonna to have to create the holes and create the systems. I will be sending out a handout about how to do a wine barrel conversion with the follow-up email. And if you wanna check these out, the one on the left is at Gamble Gardens in Palo Alto, and the one on the right is in Cupertino at McClellan Ranch. There are basic rain barrel kits. These are the type of kits that you can get on Amazon, Lowe's, at Home Depot, any hardware store. Um, oh, I almost said Orchard Supply. <laughs> any, any local Ace Hardware, any hardware store locally. Um, the one on the left is a raindrop box, and this is designed by a local high school student in San Carlos. So that's a little bit more specialized. I'll make sure that that information goes out in the follow-up email as well. Um, these are all generally 50 to 100 gallons. Uh, sometimes you'll find some larger ones depending on the sites, but you can get ones like that blend in with your landscape perfectly like the rock or ones that you can, you know, put a plant on top and there's, there's a lot of different styles. And these kits usually come with everything you need to set it up. So it'll come with the drill bits, it'll come with all the parts, everything you need to do the installation, including instructions. If you're really into recycling, which is great, love it, you can do food grade barrels. So on the left, we have some recycled olive oil barrels. These you can find at the Raft Barrel Preserve. We saw the picture in the first earlier slide of the full system finish. On the right, these are blue barrels. Um, both of these systems here are actually daisy chained together. You don't have to daisy chain a food grade barrel. You can do it individually as just one standalone barrel and you can paint them. If you put a base, a primer coat on them, you can paint them and have them blend into your garden. 
But if you decide you want a little higher capacity, you can daisy chain. And daisy chaining is connecting the barrels. So you can see really clearly in this picture from Hoover Park, the water comes in here in the first barrel. And then there's this pipe about um, eight inches up from the bottom of the barrel. And that pipe connects all the barrels. And what you can't see is they're actually connected at the top in the back as well. So as the water goes in and the water starts to fill here, it will fill fairly evenly, if I could draw evenly, on all four barrels. And all four of those barrels will fill simultaneously with water. Should the water come in really, really fast and this half inch pipe on the bottom can't accommodate and the first one fills all the way, there is a backup system on these barrels that they're connected up here at the top as well. So it will overflow into the second barrel, cascading down the line. And then that is set up to overflow and to irrigate a rain, the rain garden at Hoover Park in Palo Alto. Um, you can see in this system, we do have that first flush diverter on the left. We do have a leaf heater on the right. So this has some of those extra accessories we talked about, but not all of the extra accessories. Susie, did we have any questions about rain barrels before I move on to cisterns? Yes, I think this one's particularly um, not viewed in the middle here. Um, will it be useful to install only one rain barrel, or do we need to install rain barrels on all, all four corners of the house to balance them? It is absolutely a personal choice. So every house is different. Um, I do recommend before choosing your, your rain barrel site, we're actually gonna talk about choosing your system after the, the cisterns, but I do really recommend thinking about how you're gonna use that water. Because if you wanna use that water to irrigate your garden and your garden's in the northwest corner of your house, you probably don't wanna put your rain barrel at the southeast corner of your house because it's gonna take a lot more effort to get that water over to your garden if it's on the opposite side of the house from your barrels. If you want to use that water um, on four separate gardens that are all around your house, it might make sense to put a barrel next to each one. Uh, you also want to take a look at your downspouts during a rain event and sometimes uh, some of your downspouts will be producing water and others won't. And a lot of that's just the slope of your house and where the rain's hitting, or if you have a tree covering part of your house that's slowing the rain down. Um, it's, you know, you, you're probably, if you're only putting 50 gallons in each one, even if you have less water coming out of one downspout, it'll probably fill all, all of them because we already looked, we're having more than 10,000 gallons worth of water coming off of a thousand square foot roof throughout the year you know, 50 gallons is just a drop in the bucket there. So you're going to fill that. So it's really, it's really a usage and a, a personal decision for where you want it. You also want to think about, you know, is this going to block a pathway? Is this going to block an alleyway? Um, will I still be able to walk past these barrels to get to where I need to go? Because you don't want to block your path in any way. Um, sorry, Susie, go ahead. I was gonna say, thanks, Chris. We'll, we'll answer these at the end. I also wanna acknowledge Mandy, I see your raised hand and we'll get to you at the end of the presentation as well. Awesome. So daisy training's great. You, in this case, in Hoover Park, we have a 220 gallon capacity, which as we mentioned before, over 200 gallons for a single barrel becomes a cistern. So this is giving you the same capacity as a cistern, but using rain barrels. But if you actually want to go the next step and look at cisterns, there are some different types of options. So above ground cisterns like these, this is a 500 gallon Roto Plus barrel that you can see at the Peninsula Conservation Center in Palo Alto. And you can see this is in the process of being installed in this picture. We have a wonderful worker up on a ladder posing for the picture. Um, and the one on the right is the one we already looked at for our anatomy picture at Gamble Gardens as 265 gallons. Both of these are set up to overflow and drain into rain gardens. When you have this much water stored, it's really great to have something planned for it. You, you want to have an idea of where you want to use this water because 500 gallons is a decent amount of water and we want to know where it's going. 
a lot of people ask me what the life expectancy is on barrels like this. These cisterns, I believe, have a 35-year guarantee with something like a, an 80 or 90-year life expectancy. Like, these are built to last. These are very thick-walled cisterns. They're designed so that the uh, same with the rain barrels. You're not having any light coming in, so you're not going to be growing anything in, in the barrels. They're designed to be used for rainwater and to store the water and to use the water. Um, when you get into a cistern for the City of Palo Alto's rebate program, you do have to have them installed by a licensed contractor. And that contractor will really go over with you all the specifics for your house. Does it make sense in this location? Is there a better location? Does an above ground cistern make sense? Or maybe a below ground cistern makes more sense for you? And all of those questions, if you are considering a cistern, you're going to go over very specific questions for your own home with your contractor. Um, if you take a look at a, a below ground cistern, you have a lot of the same parts that we had for the rain barrels or the above ground cisterns. You still have that inlet coming from there. You're still going to have a screening or a mesh, both the inlet and the overflow and the outlet. You're going to have that screening. Um, you're going to have a pump that actually is in your below ground cistern. So you can see here you have a pump and this is not going to be that you know $80 pump you looked at before. This is going to be a pump that's that's going to be really built in. It's going to be wired in and your contractor is going to take care of all that. And that pump will be set up to take the water out and wherever you want to use the water. You'll have an access point at the top at the ground level of a vent path and you also have a vent pipe. Those are so that the, you know, the air can vent out as the water fills. If you think about um, a laundry soap container, if you don't pop the top and let the air in, it stops letting the, water, the laundry soap out at the bottom. It's the same idea. It needs to have air in so it can equalize to keep the tank healthy and let the water fill and be used. You're also gonna need to overflow it you're going to want that overflow to run away from your home and if possible into landscaping, but it has to run onto your own property, same as before. You cannot flood your neighbor out with your, with your rain system. Um, so we started to kind of talk about choosing your system and that was a great question. You know, all of these are really personal decisions. So you want to decide you know, what is your harvesting potential? Go through and do the math and see what, what type of barrel or cistern works for you. You wanna decide how many downspouts you wanna hook into the system. Do you wanna hook two separate downspouts into one system? Like this picture here, it's a little hard to see, but there's actually, if we were able to see off the picture, there's actually another downspout coming from a different a different side. So this one comes from two sides of the building and then goes into one set of, of barrels. Or do you want to just have separate barrels at each downspout? How much space do you have to install it? Can I, do I have enough room for a 265 gallon cistern? Do I have enough room for a 500 gallon cistern? Or can I not fit something that big, but maybe I can put four 50 gallon barrels daisy chained together? What space do I have next to my house? Uh, where am I going to use the water? How am I going to use the water? These are really important because, again, you really don't want your barrel to end up on the opposite side of the house from where you want to use the water. It's not insurmountable, but it, it'll get frustrating. Um, you really want to think about your drainage and your overflow. Do you have a place for the water to go, the excess water? If you already have a French drain, you're all set. Um, if where the water from your downspouts currently going is an issue, you probably want to get that water going somewhere else on your property. If you like where your downspout water is currently going, you're probably going to want to overflow to that same spot. And then you also want to look at your, your personal view, what you think is pretty aesthetically pleasing. You know, if you like the wine barrels or if you really like the way the, the recycled grid barrels look, or if you're an artist and you can take one of those olive oil barrels and paint it like this one in the picture, which makes it look absolutely gorgeous. I do not have the skills to do something like that. So wine barrels are my favorite.
Um, just to recap, these are the types of barrels we looked at, and that's all part of choosing your system. We had those food grade barrels, the wine barrels, the daisy chaining, cisterns, and below ground cisterns, as well as the basic kits. So just, you know, to kind of get you thinking now that you've heard all of them, you know, which one do I like, which one do I think might be right for me. To maintain your barrels, if you really want to clean those gutters, here's a picture in the top right. You can see that clutter is actually growing things at this point because it hadn't been cleaned in so long. You can get gutter scoops, which are a scoop that's specifically designed to scoop out your gutter. Um, there's people who their most of their job is to clean out gutters. You can hire people that'll come do it two to three times a year for you. Um, you can also, you know, get up there on a ladder and do it with a nice pair of gloves like this photo. And, you know, they're all great options just to keep your gutters clean. Uh, really want to do that like twice a year. Um, if you're in an area that really gets a lot of leaf debris on your house during the winter when it is raining, you may want to do it like once a month, depending on, you know, how bad your own gut gutters are. Um, this is something even if you don't have a rain barrel, it's good to keep your gutters clean. Um, twice a year, you really want to check and empty your leaf feeder. Uh, like I said, though, I do it when I'm walking to the store to go to the gro go get groceries. I'm walking out my door. I'll look at it if I see there's stuff on it. It's very easy to just pop the leaf feeder lid off and clean it. Um, just tap it against the side of the building and everything falls off and put it back on. Um, cleaning your first flush diverter if you decide to install it. Really, after the first and the last storm, um, this is about the minimal twice a year. Use your water. You really want to use your water. We're going to talk about that in the next slide, but you can store that water for five years. It's going to be fine. It's, it, it'll have a little bit of an earthy smell to it because it has that little bit of compost in it. Um, ideally, you want to use it every storm, but you know if you forget and, and the water really sits there, it's not a big deal. About every five years, you want to just flush some clean water through your through your barrels. So this is usually right about this time of year as we're getting into October and we're thinking about the next rain events coming up. You want to your your barrels probably already empty. You've used it through this whole dry season, and you just want to take a hose in there, a high pressure hose, and just hose around. You're only going to probably use five five gallons of water to clean it out. And you're just going to high pressure hose around the whole inside to kind of swish it around. If you have a drip system or irrigation on there, you're going to disconnect that and just let it drain out through the main thing because this will get all of that um, bigger sediment that you have in your system to be drained out. And you really talked about using your water. It's really important to use your rainwater. Um, you want to use it regularly and empty your barrels between storms. And this is just so that we can do that slow it, spread it, sink it that we talked about. Because if you leave your rain barrel full and we get another rain, all of that rain goes straight through the overflow. But if you wait, you know, the day before the storm, you empty that water into your garden and let that garden soak it up, then you can capture all new rain for the next storm. Um, you know, we talked about using a pump or doing everything gravity fed. We talked about filling a bird bath or a landscape pond or a dry creek. It's also great for washing tools. Um, you can just water your garden or landscape. If you're going to do drip irrigation, we talked about that extra filter you really want to set up. Um, for a hose or watering can is, is the more basic system where you really don't need a filter. You just hook the hose on and turn open the valve. Um, you can connect it to a toilet for flushing, but you do actually need a permit to do this, and this is something you would have a contractor to do for you. It's just another use for the rainwater if you have a large enough system that will use your water a lot faster than landscaping will, but it's an idea, especially if you, if you really are invested in getting a larger system. It's easier if you're doing a new build for a new house, um, but it is possible to have a contractor set that up and you can get a permit to do that. Um, also, just like we said before, slow it, spread it, sink it. So we have a couple questions, and then we're going to head into the rebate program. That's right. Um, okay, one question from Beth North. How do you clean these large cisterns, or do they even need to be cleaned? 
So same thing, just get a, your regular municipal hose, your regular hose that's on the side of your house and that pressurized hose cap and you're just gonna you know, open up that hatch or the, the top of the barrel. So the, the one I think that really people think of is hard to clean is a spoiler ground toaster, but you open up this hatch and you get in there with the hose and you just kind of spray everything. Um, with, the, with the same thing with the barrels and cisterns, um, with some barrels, the whole top comes off, like these basic kits here, that whole top comes off here. So if you were really worried about sediment, you can take that whole top off. Um, but really, just taking a hose in there and spraying around is going to do enough to kick up and mix up enough of the sediment and clean it out that you won't have that, that issue. Okay, one more. Um, I'm going to trans can you put a rain tub or in this case probably a barrel on top of the roof if so how i wouldn't recommend it water weighs about eight pounds per gallon so these barrels get quite heavy and i wouldn't want that much weight on my roof also your roof is a much larger area um, to capture water from than just the top of the rain barrel. So if you were to put it someplace, um, we'll say in the middle of your yard where it's not connected to any catchment system, it's only going to capture that, you know, about two foot across area that's at the top of the barrel. And that's all the water it's going to capture. So that makes your, um, your base area so much smaller if you do the math for the, that equation we looked at earlier. Whereas if you have a thousand square feet going down one, one downspout, that's already bringing all that water together to one point for you. So connecting it to a downspout, it makes it a little bit easier. For folks who live in apartments, if you get a permission to do this, you can do it on a patio. If you have a downspout next to your patio, make sure you get permission from your building manager or owner before you do that. But it is possible and I have seen it done and people will use just um, watering cans and water plants around the house with it. Great, and then one last one before we get moving. What is the best way to control for mosquitoes and stored water in rain barrels? Screening, you absolutely have to have that screening on the input and the overflow and your output if, if it's set up um, that anything could crawl into it. You, you, this is a legal requirement. So you absolutely, we do not want to increase the mosquito breeding locations in our area. So make sure you do have proper screening. And this is kind of the same type of screening you would use as a window screen. So basic screening, a lot of these systems come with it. Some of them don't, but make sure you put your screening on there. You can buy it at any hardware store. Great advice, Chris. Okay, we can move on to the next part of our presentation. I want to introduce Pam from the city of Palo Alto. Pam, you're on mute. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Boyle Rodriguez, uh, the stormwater compliance manager for the city of Palo Alto. And, you know, most of today has focused on the actual uh, types of stormwater treatment measures that you can put in that are also covered by a rebate through our rebate program. Uh, we're not going to dig into the details of the rebate program yet. Um, we're going to probably have a separate, um, separate workshop that focuses on that, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about it and tell you about our website. Uh, we're working to update our rebate program in general and our website, and uh, partly because we want to uh, kick, it, kick off a new partnership that we have with the Santa Clara Valley Water District or just Valley Water. And, as you know, they are a water purveyor for south of East Palo Alto into a lot of Santa Clara County. And we also, because we're at the cusp of also um, sharing San Francisco uh, public utility water, this uh, webinar is part of a separate water purveyor partnership, but this, rate, this stormwater rebate program is with Valley Water. They, have, they offer it to all their customers, which means that it's a pretty large area. Uh, we just happen to also have a stormwater rebate program, so we found a way to work together. Uh, and so we wanted to explain that a little bit to you because it might seem complicated in the beginning, 
we're trying to find a, a way to streamline it for all the residents and business business owners and, and workers in the city of Palo Alto. So uh, I am sorry if you did not work or live in Palo Alto, uh, you wouldn't be able to apply to the city of Palo Alto rebate program, but you should still look into the Valley water rebates. You may be able to apply to one of those. So I wanted to bring your attention to this table on the screen. Uh, you have rain barrel cisterns, pervious pavement and rain gardens. And you heard about all these four today. You learned about all the multiple benefits of using any of these. And I wanted to point out that through our partnership, Valley Water and the city will provide rebates to, for rain barrels, cisterns, and rain gardens. This means that whether or not you live in the city of Palo Alto, you can receive a rebate from Valley Water for rain barrel cisterns and rain gardens but not pervious pavement. Now, you probably already know, we're gonna talk about it later, uh, but Valley Water does offer rebates for a lot of other type water saving programs. So uh, you should definitely look into that. Uh, but City of Palo Alto in particular, in addition to these other three, also offers uh, rebates to pervious pavement. Now, if you looked into this program a few months ago, you may know that we weren't offering uh, rebates for rain gardens before July. So that is new for us. Uh, we've also taken green roofs out of our program. Uh, we realized it wasn't a great fit. So we're no longer providing rebates for green roofs. So these are the four stormwater treatment measures we now allow. So this, is, this, is actually, this table is actually taken from our website. And what you can see is that the total rebate amount is listed for each of these items. And so for the rain barrel, cistern, and rain garden, that total rebate amount includes the rebate that you would receive from Valley Water and from City of Palo Alto. So for rain, the rain barrel, for example, Valley Water provides $35 for each rain barrel. So if you're daisy chaining, that would be for each of those daisy chain rain barrels. And then the City of Palo Alto also offers a rebate of $35 per rain barrel. So um, if you maybe don't have enough room for a cistern, whether above ground or below ground, but you want to try to capture more water than one, one rain barrel can capture, then you can think about a daisy chain system. Or if you can just do one rain barrel, uh, you can apply to that. Uh, as you can see, we have a size requirement. So this is criteria that has to be followed, whether you apply for Valley Water or the city. Uh, we define a rain barrel as under two, as before 40 and 199 gallons, and a cistern as, as 200 gallons and over 200 gallons. And so, you know, certainly the, the bigger the system that you can fit on your yard, the better, obviously, you'll capture more rain. Um, and with rain gardens, we provide a rebate for a dollar per square foot of roof that you can divert to the rain garden. So in through that application, you will need to, cap, uh, to measure your roof, and then uh, we, would do a, we would confirm that the size that you submit is the size that would be diverted. Uh, for pervious pavement, it's actually the, the amount of square foot of surface area that you install, you would receive $1.50 for that square foot. So rain barrels, you can install those on your own. You don't need a licensed contractor as you learned today from Chris, who provided a lot of very helpful information, you could do it on your own, uh, or at least get some friends to help you who are, who are handy and have great tools. Uh, but for cisterns, pervious pavement, and rain gardens, you do need a licensed contractor. Uh, if you can move to the next slide, please. So for uh, just, you know, I'm going to go over this quickly. So whether you live in a home or whether you own a business or what, or ask your business to uh, your, as an employee to install something, um, each of these have a lifetime maximum. So the city has lifetime maximums, Valley Water has lifetime maximums. So you can see that for in Palo Alto, for example, if you wanted to install uh, pervious pavement, then you would look at the column under Palo Alto. Because Valley Water does not provide a rebate for pervious pavement, 
But if you want to do rain barrels, cisterns, or rain gardens, look at the right where it says well, total lifetime. So you could receive, if you're a resident, up to 3000 And for if you're a commercial owner, you could receive up to 55000 Okay, next slide, please. And so, as I mentioned, we're not going to get into the details about the program today, but I do want to point out that uh, it's really important to read through our website and you can see the um, city of Palo Alto forward slash stormwater will take you to the city of Palo Alto stormwater rebate program. And there is another website for Valley water. What we are hoping to do with our city website is make it as clear as possible so that if you go to that website, you will understand how the partnership works and how it would work to apply for a rebate both through the city and Valley Water. Um, so let me point out that if, if you are applying for that rebate through the partnership, that you would apply through the Valley Water um, web, website. However, I would say if you want some really detailed information about the program, maybe visit our site first. Uh, if you could just go back, I'm hoping that, oh, this is a, okay. Unfortunately, this is a PDF, so I cannot go to the website. I was going to take you through the website. Um, okay, we'll skip that for now. Um, so we can go to the next one. I just wanted to uh, make it really clear, and I'm sure I have already. So the difference between City of Palo Alto and Valley Water is, um, as you know, uh, City of Palo Alto provides rebates for all of those four stormwater treatment measures, but Valley Water does not provide the previous pavement pavement rebate. Uh, please do not install anything or don't even purchase anything till you talk to us first. And then even if you buy something and you've talked to us, don't install anything till you get a notice of proceed from us. And that would be done through an email. Uh, so you can have documentation yourself and that we can have that documentation. So once you get that notice of proceed, then you can get started. Um, and you would get that information from, from us. Um, the, uh, we, as a city, uh, will be inspecting all your stormwater treatment measures once you install them, and we may uh, provide a pre-inspection, as pre-installation inspection as well, particularly for pervious pavement and the large cisterns. Uh, you would not receive an inspection from Valley Water staff unless you choose to use their program rebates and you want to change your lawn to, uh, do you want to remove your lawn and put in some native and drought tolerant plants? And while you're doing that, maybe you can put in a rain barrel or a cistern. Then if that's the case, then they'll visit you. But otherwise, if you're just putting in one of these stormwater treatment measures, you won't get a visit from Valley Water, but you can definitely get a visit from us, uh, which is, which is um, a great, um, experience for you because then you can ask us for help in the, uh, when we visit your home and we can provide a bit more guidance. Um, you'll definitely need a city permit for most things except rain barrels, um, although there is criteria that you need to follow um, in, in terms of how much distance should be between your home and whatever treatment measure you put in, etc. You'll see that on the website. And if we can go on to the next one, please. And we won't be able to go into this too much, but I just wanted to bring attention that Valley Water has a lot of different rebate programs to help you save water both indoor and outdoor. And a lot of that is also through a partnership with the City of Palo Alto Utilities. So there are a lot of really great rebates that you should look into. Um, in particular, our program just works with their, what they call their rainwater capture program. And that's where we partner on the, on the three stormwater treatment measures that I mentioned. So we will send out an email with the different websites that can provide you more information. And um, if you please move forward, uh, there will also be, if you go to the next slide, please, uh, there will also be in the email an attachment to some different, to some different uh, handouts. Uh, so you'll be able to find resources, you'll be able to go to our website, and you'll be able to get some information, some details about what Chris was talking about. Um, and we only have one minute, so I'm gonna move forward to the end. So 
I'm wondering, Susie, if, if maybe we can fit in a couple of questions. Certainly. Um, you, I'm sorry, just one second. If you could go to the last slide, it has our contact information. There we go. Thank you. All right. Um, we do have some more questions, and I know it's 1130. If you need to go, we thank you so much for being here, but we will be staying to answer some questions um, regarding the, the programs that Chris mentioned, and as well as the City of Palo Alto rebate, if you have any of those. So stay around if you have some more time. Um, so our next question is... Susie, before we get into that, I'm just going to take the slide back to the equations for calculating your harvesting potential. I do see we have some questions on that, and I just want people to get a chance to write down that equation. Okay. And I'll bring it back to this uh, clean bay at cityofpalalto.org contact information after. Sure. In the meantime, Pam, this one maybe you can field from Mandy. For Santa Clara residents, can they apply for rain garden rebate and lawn replacement rebate in the same year with a $3,000 max? Uh, so you can apply for both of those in the same year from Valley Water. However, I don't remember if that's the Valley Water max or not, but whatever was in that column for the, for the Valley Water maximum is what your maximum would be. Yes. And they actually have a, a because they have a large service area, they have a, uh, people answering the phone all the time. And so if you go to their website and give them a call, they can answer your questions. Okay, we have a next question. Um, I, go ahead, Chris. Sorry, I have a question here. Can you run the water into a swimming pool from Susan and Jack Pines? And that's a great question. Um, for most locations, you do need a permit to do this. It is possible you will filter the water a little bit more than you would for general landscaping to bring it in and then it's going to be treated as you would treat any water for a pool. It's going to be treated as well. So it is possible, but you will have to look at permitting requirements and most likely you will need to talk to a contractor. All right. Thank you. And then our next question is, given Palo Alto's rain patterns, would we have to have two irrigation systems, one during the rainy season using captured rainwater and one using a regular water system? Uh, not necessarily, depending on what size um, you decide to harvest, how large of a system you install, you, that system might be able to get you fully through the dry season. Uh, what some people will do is they'll have their entire system hooked up to their rain barrel and if they get to say October and we haven't seen any rain yet and they're starting to run out, they might actually use a little bit of city municipal water to refill that rain barrel. So you're not actually hooking up two separate systems. You're just refilling your rain barrel with a little bit of municipal water. There's also programs such as um, purple, purple Pipe. Pam, correct me if you know if I'm wrong, but I think it's called Purple Pipe that yes. uses reclaimed water and you can refill your rain barrel. You have them come refill your barrel and it is all reclaimed water. So you're not using potable water. Great, thanks. Um, and I'm going to read one more question, but um, before I do, Chris, if you want to go back down to the final slide with the contact information, that would be great. Um, and then our next question from Oliver is, I don't water my plants during fall or winter, and it doesn't rain much in summer. So any barrel slash cistern I'd install would realistically be fully cycled only a few times a year. The alternative, watering with tap water, costs roughly $10 for 750 gallons. In this context, can rain harvesting system make financial sense? So I'm actually going to go back to the rebates page for this answer. Um, if you take a look at this rebates page, and just for the most basic one, we're going to talk rain barrels. Uh, if you can get $70 per rain barrel, and up to $70 as a rebate, and you decide you want to install a 50-gallon barrel, the entire cost for that barrel that you're, and, and the system that you're installing, you're 
looking at 65 to $70. So that rebate can actually cover all of your costs. And then all that, that 50 gallons of water you have is at that point free water. It's coming from the sky. It's not costing you anything because the city of Palo Alto and Valley Water are paying for that barrel. So that is a way that you can fully cover the cost of it. And then that's 50 gallons that you're not buying from city water. And that's 50 gallons of storm water that you are keeping out of our storm drains. You're keeping out of our creeks once they get polluted and end up in the storm drains. So it, while it may not, 50 gallons may not seem like a lot of water, it can make a, a bigger difference if everyone does it. And it won't cost you anything. Great. Um, and we just got another question. Um, and this one talks about smart controllers. Are there smart controllers available to control the valves on your rain rainwater capture system? I'm thinking about something similar to Ratio, which she currently has, she or he currently has. Yes. Um, I am not totally familiar with the Ratio system. I think it can be set up to work from a rain barrel. This might be something a contractor would be able to set up for you. I'm not sure if this is a DIY type situation, but there are definitely smart controllers available that can be hooked into a rain system. And this is for those of you who aren't familiar with Ratio, um, uh, Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency does have a rebate program for it, which is on this slide. All right. Um, that takes us to the end of our questions, and there are no raised hands. Um, so again, just wanted to thank everyone for coming and joining us. If you did have any questions, feel free to contact um, Pam, who's Oh, excuse me, contact information was at the last slide. And as we discussed, uh, there will be an email going out to all participants with links that you saw during the presentation, as well as a recording of the presentation itself. So until then, have a lovely rest of your weekend. Take care. Thank you, everyone.